for your presence in God's house today to set aside time for him to honor him. I, I want to ask you this morning, what is worship? You have to make a definition of the word worship. How would you define it? It has to be more than just saying that God is great or that God is better than us. I mean, I'm pretty sure LeBron James is a better basketball player than I am. And I can acknowledge that, but that doesn't mean I worship him. Doesn't mean I think that he deserves to be treated with any more dignity than any other person. But yet, to worship means that we assign worth, that we assign value, that we acknowledge a greatness that's beyond just being better than us at doing something. Almost every culture that's ever been found has some sort of worship. They give something to a god, a deity of some kind. They bow themselves, they humble themselves, they acknowledge that greatness. But you know, that seems primitive to us. The idea of saying anyone, even God, is better than me is somewhat distasteful and insulting to the average American. I think American Christians have skewed the meaning of worship beyond any people who have ever lived in all of history. We practice what we call worship, but if you went around America today to churches all over our country, uh, you would find people who were doing things for their own good, they were worshiping with the hopes of attracting others, worshiping to make us feel better, worshiping to maybe try to manipulate God into doing our will. We have preachers who stand up and offer self-help sessions over proclaiming the majesty and the power of God. Churches focus on getting people to like us. And they want to have worship services that people will enjoy over working hard to point people to Christ and to praise His holy name. I'm afraid way too many worship services have turned into sales rallies where preachers are nothing more than motivational speakers and the only power is in the enthusiasm that we can generate in ourselves. But I want you to know this morning, there is an unexpected power in worship in real worship, in simply praising Him, marveling at His presence. And beyond that, worship actually is the solution to all the things that we face in life. I'm going to read just two verses this morning from Psalm chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Psalm chapter 4, tremble and do not sin. Meditate in your heart upon your bed and be still. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and trust in the Lord. These words were written by David. They were written at a time of upheaval in the country, a time of treachery and revolt. He wrote these words to his loyal supporters because his loyal supporters were stirred up. They were ready to go crazy. They were ready to act rashly. And he knew that what, what they might do would not turn out good. And in that time of great loss and, and, and unrest, David offers this solution. 
In verse 4, the, the first word of that verse is one that's rather difficult to translate. Some other translations of the Bible say, be angry, or be controlled by anger, or complain, or be disturbed, or even stand in awe. The New American Standard that I read from says tremble, and, and, and that really holds close to the root meaning of this word. It's, it's the idea of being internally stirred up and agitated, being ready to overreact, ready to act on impulse. You can see that being suddenly filled with rage would certainly fit the, the sense of this word and the situation that David was in, but it can refer to any type of emotion that just gets a hold of you, that, that, that just tends to take over and, and, and spur you to, to rash choices. With that in mind, as we read these words, tremble and do not sin. He's saying when you're beset by whatever stirs you up, it would probably be something different for every person in this room. When you're beset by whatever it is that stirs you up, that usually gets you in trouble, don't sin. Instead, get alone. Get away from the distractions around you where you can think more clearly. He says, meditate on your bed. And that day, the bed might be the only place you could go to be by yourself. And he says, be still. Other translations say, be silent or be quiet. That word can even mean cause to die. Tremble. But don't sin. Think about what's going on and do all that you can to cause that trembling to die, to not respond to it, to not give in to it. Give your best to squash those feelings that are welling up in you and, and pushing you toward what you know is wrong. In other words, he says, start practicing some self-discipline. And that effort should teach you very quickly that you need help. You see, we cannot make ourselves holy or, or righteous or sinless. It, it's not within the power of any person to overcome sin by the force of your will. If you understand addiction, then you understand sin. You indulge for relief. You find some temporary satisfaction followed by the crash the letdown, the guilt, the regret. And you promise never to do it again. And then the pressure builds and you find yourself seeking the cure in the very thing that caused the sickness. And so the cycle repeats again and again and again. And there's no escape from sin by human effort. David tells us here, if you can pause for a moment, when that inner trembling starts, when you feel yourself getting stirred up, if you can get alone and get still and think logically, at some point you will certainly realize that you can't overcome it on your own. That there's only one source for real help and there's only one way to approach that source. And so you go to God in worship. He says in verse 5, offer the sacrifices of righteousness. 
You could read different versions of the Bible and they might say offer right sacrifices or correct sacrifices or prescribed sacrifices or offer sacrifices in the right spirit. One even says do what is right as a sacrifice. But this word we have here translated righteousness, it's a word that's used as an attribute of God Offer sacrifices of God's righteousness. The sense is to worship God as he prescribes. Worship him appropriately. Worship him as his character deserves and demands. The sense is that being still leads to giving up on the idea of handling your issue by the force of your will and admitting that you need God and that you're willing to come to God on God's terms. He's not telling you to beg God to solve your problem. The focus is not on you. It's not on what you need. It's not even on getting God's help. The focus is on honoring God for who He is as He deserves. It's what I ask you to do every week at the beginning of our service. I ask you to block out everything else and focus on God and God alone and direct your attention to Him and acknowledge His greatness and His goodness, His right to be worshipped. Do that instead of obsessing about your anger or your frustration or your bitterness or or whatever it is that's stirring you up. Instead of feeding your fury, humble yourself before God and genuinely worship. Do you remember reading about Peter when he was in the boat with the disciples and there was a storm raging and he saw Jesus walking on the water? Peter calls out to Jesus and said, if you're real, command me to come out there and walk with you. And Jesus told him to come. And the Bible says Peter stepped out of the boat and Peter started walking on the water. Until he took his eyes off Jesus. When Peter took his eyes off Jesus and he looked at the storm, the storm consumed him. But as long as his eyes were on Jesus, the storm had no power over him. There may be some people here today, and you've been spiritually defeated by your anger or by some hurt from the past. It may be from addiction or a relationship with parents or children or spouse or neighbor. It may be a daycare that stirs you up. A Sunday school pass class. A person from long ago who hurt you and you just can't forget it. It can even be a failure in the past that you won't let yourself forgive. This morning, you need to get your eyes off of the trembling and put your eyes on God and worship Him 100%. Drive every other thought about anyone or anything else out of your mind and give God your full attention. Our younger son, James has wonderful in-laws, very faithful Christians, very hardworking people, very successful people. They had something happen to them maybe 15 or so years ago that, that nobody should go through. Their daughter was killed in a car wreck. Their daughter was a freshman in college. She was a faithful Christian person, active in her church. She made good grades. She she just had everything going 
for her. And she was taken away suddenly. One Sunday, while I was their pastor, and this had been maybe six or seven years since that happened, maybe longer, I preached from Isaiah chapter 6. Are you familiar with Isaiah chapter 6? In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And Isaiah describes that vision. He was high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. And he talks about the cherubim with six wings. With two they covered their mouths and with two they covered their feet and with two they flew and they cried out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And Isaiah said, woe is me, I am undone. Because I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the Lord. At the end of that sermon, James's mother-in-law came to me and she told me, back when our daughter was killed in that car wreck, there were all kinds of people who tried to console us. They tried to encourage us. They tried to make us feel better. And nothing helped until one Sunday when the preacher preached from Isaiah chapter 6 about the glory of God. And she said it was the glory of God that started to heal my soul that helped me to get my focus back and to get back on track to move forward in my life. I want you all to know there is real power in worship. Not going after God for something, not trying to butter Him up so He'll be good to us, just praising who He is. If you go to worship week after week and you feel like it's just boring, it's just powerless, it's just no big deal, I don't know what you're doing, but you're not worshiping. Worshiping is not putting in time. It's not doing what you should. It's not even hoping to get something. It's a pure lowering of yourself and lifting him up, honestly acknowledging his indescribable majesty. Worship is putting yourself in your place by putting him in his proper place in your life. And it bothers me that too many Christians treat worship as an optional thing. If I have time, if I feel like it, and too often, when we come to worship, our mind is on the temperature of the room or how soft the cushions are or evaluating the singing or the preaching or what am I going to do later or what did I do yesterday or, or when will it be over or who is here and who's not here on anything and everything except God. Folks, I want you to know something. A bad sermon can't keep you from worshiping. A, a bad song can't keep you from worshiping. Now, they may not help very much, but worship is about you and God. It's about being focused on Him and awed by Him. Finding it impossible to believe just how good he is and how much he loves us and how little we deserve it. Many of us never really worship because we never really get our minds on God. We have no sense of his splendor and glory. We feel absolutely no need to humble ourselves before him. Because we have no awareness of his presence. 
And so we criticize. We say, well, it was boring. It just really didn't do anything for me. We'll blame anyone and everyone for our failure to worship. But worship is powerful. And not only is it powerful, worship is the solution to the things in your life that grab you and won't let go. It's because when you really worship, you really encounter His awesome presence, you know you can trust Him. The final outcome of worship Every time you come here, every time you worship privately in your home or wherever you might be, the final outcome of worship should be that you walk away trusting God. I've gotten a fresh glimpse of God. I've learned something new about God. I know God better. And the more I know Him, the more I trust Him. Worship. It's not a self-help session. It's not a therapy session. It's not something that we do to make us feel better. It's a time to marvel at the wonder and the greatness of God. You see, you can go get self-help from any number of places. But it's only in worship that you can encounter God in such a way that you're transformed by the power of His presence. Now, the Bible condemns hypocritical worship. Worship that's just all for show with no meaning. Worship that has no intent of changing no matter what God might show me. Worship that's only intended to pacify God or to try to stay on His good side. Worship that simply desires to be absolved and set free to do as I please. That kind of worship is heresy. It ignores the sovereignty of God. It slanders the sovereignty of God. And it's not really worship. And God rejects it. But God never turns away the imperfect who are hurting and needing and longing for Him. You see, it's not a matter of being good enough to worship or being worthy to worship. It's a matter of knowing that you need to worship and knowing that God deserves your worship. And the grace and the peace and the mercy and the strength and the faithfulness and all those qualities that should characterize the hearts of genuine believers. Those aren't things that you generate within yourself by by trying really hard. They are the direct result of humbling yourself before Him in worship. And He says, you do all that you can to control the outside. But if you stop there, you're just being a good person. See, once you do all you can to control what's on the outside, you throw yourself fully into worship. You you encounter God personally. You open yourself up to His scrutiny. You submit to His assessment of yourself. And you acknowledge Him as your Lord in your obedience. And you trust Him to change that part of you that you can't control by letting Him do that work in you. Giving you spiritual life, giving you joy and direction and purpose and power. And the one thing you know for sure is that you're going to need to keep on worshiping. You know that there are always going to be things you can't control. There's always going to be things that that are too big for you and you always need Him. Maybe this morning, 
you would be bold enough to ask yourself, when was the last time I really worshipped? When I brought my struggles that, that I'm fighting against with all I have and, and admitted my inability to hold on for much longer, and I simply bowed before God and honored Him. Are you letting Him work on the inside to give you a fighting chance on the outside? You know what the Israelites did when they prepared for battle? They worshipped. They didn't get together and have a, a pep rally and pump each other up and say, oh, we're going to make it. They just worshiped God. And they trusted Him. If you have any intent of serving God this week, if you're working in Bible school this week and you're going to be serving God or if you're going to be serving Him somewhere, you're going to find yourself in a spiritual battle you're going to have some trembling inside. And it's going to want to bubble up and control you. And you don't realize it, but what you need is not to beg God to help you. What you need is to worship Him. To come together and worship Him. And to go home and worship Him. And go to work and worship Him. And folks, if you think you don't need to worship to live the Christian life, then you just really have no idea what God is about. He's not about just a ritual of getting together and going through the motions, but He's about His glory that He wants to reveal to you and put inside of you and send out through you and make a difference in the world. The greatest act of worship is to repent in faith. To, to give Him your life. To trust Him as your Lord and Savior. When you encounter His presence, He draws you through His awesomeness. He, he convicts you of your need and He offers to welcome you into His family. And I wonder this morning, does anyone need to take that step? Will you hand that need over to Jesus in faith, believing that, that He can handle that need and forgive your sin and make you His? Or maybe this morning, does anyone need to recommit? To say, I'm going to go beyond being a good person. I'm not just going to work hard to control the outside, but I'm going to worship Him genuinely as He deserves. And I'm going to entrust the inside to Him so that He will change it so that I can move forward in His service. Maybe someone this morning would say, God is leading me to, to add my membership to this church. You, he would bring you in here so that you can bless us and so that we can bless you. So that together we can seek God's will and know His will and follow that will and support each other in doing His will. Maybe that God's dealing with someone here about something else that's on your heart and you know that you need to respond. Folks, when God reveals Himself to us, when He touches us with His Word, He wants us to respond. He doesn't do that just to make us feel better. And I want to ask you this morning, if God has spoken to you, we're going to give you a chance to respond and would you take that opportunity? Let's all stand together. Brother Lee is coming to lead us in a hymn of commitment, a hymn of invitation, hymn of surrender, whatever you might call it. If you need to respond to God, I want to ask you to come while we sing.